Hello and welcome everyone. This is a video detailing uh, recent music finds and highlights uh, from the local record convention, which I got to stop by for a bit. I highly recommend stopping at the Nashville Record Convention if you're ever uh, around town at that particular time. Uh, you can look up the information at uh, recordconventions.com. They usually have one about three to four times a year, and then they also do uh, other areas in, in southern states. But uh, anytime you can stop by a local record convention, I do highly recommend it. So uh, without further ado, uh, here are highlights of uh, records, tapes, and even a few laser discs that I've found at uh, shops and conventions. All right, so first up are two items for my ever-growing CD collection. This first one is one I've wanted to pick up for a very long time uh, for the extras and the mastering, really, but it's tricky because you have to pick up this first version instead of the later version, which was a smaller box and remastered sometime, I think about 2004 or so. But this is the original 1991 Clash on Broadway box set. Of course, this was during the era of these big long box CD sets where it was basically album tracks mixed in with extras, demos, rarities, and b-sides and singles. So unfortunately, the majority of this box is literally just selections from the albums. So I guess maybe this was sort of a sampler because I think they did a whole uh, Clash reissue around this time in 91. Uh, but the benefit of that is it's uh, much better remasters. They didn't really mess with the dynamics. So all the dynamic range is intact on this particular release. But the packaging is really nice, and the reason why you want to pick this up is for uh, great renditions uh, in digital, at least for the singles, some of the single mixes, and then all the great rarities on here, which most of this is now replicated on the later reissues and then the big sound system box set. But uh, the mastering on a lot of the later ones leaves a lot to be desired. And like I said, there's a 2004 version of this box set with the modern mastering, and it is just plain not good. Um, this version is noticeably awesome. As soon as I put it on, uh, I found it in one of the local shops, put it on in the car just to check it out. And even on my car stereo, I could notice a difference. Um, so like I said, really great dynamic mastering in here. I do highly recommend it if you come across a copy for cheap. Uh, these are now turning up for, you know, less than 10 bucks. And it's a really nice package, even though it is this, you know, long box design. But that means, of course, you get this really awesome booklet with tons of great photos and liner notes. And there's the track information for each. And the photo reproductions in here are really, really good. I grew up on box sets like these where, you know, it was a great way to sample a band's entire career or at least a period of their career. So even though it's not necessarily what I would have done, I would have liked to just had like a single disc with all of the rarities and single mixes and stuff. Um, it is pretty cool. And the, like I said before, the mastering is so good that, uh, you know, it's also really cool to have a nice digital version of some of these album tracks. Um, so, yeah, you basically get a really generous selection of all the main Clash albums in here. So, basically, some albums, even like, you know, 40 to 60%. So, <laughs> you get used to listening to, um, you know, what would be tracks in order on the album, then it suddenly jumps to a single, and you're like, wait, what? And then you have to remember you're listening to the box set. Um, so, again, the packaging's great. Uh, you also get this really cool little lyric book, which, of course, back in the day, pre-internet, uh, you know, it was a lot harder to necessarily understand, um, especially when Joe got to singing really, really fast, uh, particularly on the early uh, albums and singles. Uh, it's very difficult to keep up <laughs> and actually understand what's actually being said in the song. So, again, really nice packaging. And of course, it's just three individual uh, jewel packs. Of course, like I said before, later on, this all got condensed into a much smaller box set, and I think it was just a uh, a three-CD jewel case without the nice big booklet and stuff. So if you see this, I do actually highly recommend it, um, simply because the mastering is really, really great, and there's some really nice exclusives. I first heard about this box set because... Let me show you these others, which all have the same art, of course. And then the third one. Oops. So it's all the same art, so they could have made the box smaller, but everybody was making these big boxes back in the day. Um, but I first heard about this because I, I read that it had the long version of Straight to Hell, which runs about seven minutes. And it does indeed. It's one of the last tracks on disc three. Um, and it's basically like the raw 
I wouldn't say exactly unedited take, but it's it does feel like like just the raw session track. So it's really amazing to hear stuff like that and to get it in a version like this that doesn't have its dynamics totally ripped out. Um, so I guess in a way, this is sort of sort of maybe following in the wake or similar to something like the Beatles anthology CD sets um, where it was demos and rarities and stuff like that. Um, but then again, a vast majority of this set, it's just the actual album tracks. But uh, if you were curious about the Clash on CD and what the sound quality is like, this will give you an idea of what the earlier uh, 90s CDs are like, which I would advise get those instead of the later ones from like 99, 2004, because they have a lot of uh, loudness compression applied. The new sound system remasters, I've heard some samples. They were all um, overseen. I believe it was uh, Tim Young who did that, who, of course, mastered original Clash Final back in the day. Um, they do have dynamic range production, but they do sound much better than the CDs from the early 2000s. But, of course, if you get that whole big sound system box set, it's, like, ridiculously expensive. So this is a nice taster with really great dynamics. And, like I said, it's going for under 10 bucks. I found it for just dirt cheap. So that was really nice. This next one was a total surprise. Uh, I actually found this on Amoeba's website. Uh, they have a really great website. Of course, I'm talking about Amoeba Records in Hollywood. Uh, they offer free shipping on all orders, pretty much, um, no matter how big or how small. Um, but they run uh, website sales all the time. So they had like a 15% off site-wide sale. So I always glance through like the used listings because they also input uh, used stock that apparently hasn't sold in the store. So I was just scrolling through, and then I all randomly decided to check for soundtracks and then saw this floating around in there at a ridiculously cheap price. Um, so I was like, okay, this, this is mine. Free shipping, okay. So um, it's got the original Amoeba price sticker on it, but they had it for half of that on the website. So I picked up the La La Land Records release of the complete score of Speed, the Mark Mancina score, which uh, was so influential, it practically was used in dozens and dozens of trailers afterwards and it it influenced action movie music in the 90s so much so that you could count you, you would lose count of how many scores were like speed knockoffs and of course speed itself was always referred to as the die hard on a bus movie well the score was so influential it, like i said it just reverberated throughout the 90s um there is an original cd that's pretty good and relatively cheap but it's nowhere near complete i think I think it's pretty decent. I think it's like maybe 35 minutes of score. And then La La Land did this and the sequel score back in about, I think about 2012. And uh, then it went out of print. Um, so I think it's been out of print for a couple years. And I just happened to notice this on there. And I thought it was the standard one at first. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's got the other cover. And they were even nice enough to put an out of print sticker on it. So it was basically $10 free shipping plus 15% off. So I was like, okay. And what's great about this release, not only is it complete, not only does it have really great mastering, but of course being a release from La La Land Records, you get really great artwork. The disc itself with the bus there is pretty cool, and then the overlay is pretty good with the uh, front bus windscreen shot. And then you also get a really substantial book full of liner notes. And again, being from La La Land, their booklets are always really, really good, and the essay is is great. So, and they also do the Q by Q breakdown, where you get like a little blurb or paragraph about each of the individual cues and tracks on this release, which is really, really nice. Particularly since you know, in in terms of of film music dumb and talking in critical terms, uh, if it's an action movie score, it's usually never going to get <laughs> any sort of due diligence paid to it because you know it's for an action movie. It can't be you know serious, can it? Um, so yeah, this was a really really nice find. And then what's also cool about this is um, it's not often that they're able to carry over the licensed tracks to releases like this. So usually. You know, you'll lose the title song by uh, the various artists or the end title song and stuff. But what's cool about this is they actually were able to maintain the Billy Idol uh, end title song. Um, and, of course, I don't own the original CD, but I'm sure it's it sounds just as good. Um, because this whole CD, I've already listened to it at least once all the way through, and it sounds really excellent. So I'm glad I held off on picking up the original um, non-complete CD. 
uh, because that's usually in bins for less than five bucks. So this was a really nice surprise find. And of course, you can see the hole punch. This must have been a promo copy or something. So always check soundtrack bins. You never know what's going to turn up. And I've been very lucky. Um, I've found at least three or four um, La La Land or Varese um, uh, soundtrack releases and out-of-print ones like this. So I always try and check new arrivals for um, soundtrack CDs because it's very rare, but occasionally stuff like this will turn up. So this uh, next one came from the local record convention. I didn't think I was going to go, but I, I figured I'd just, you know, always take the chance, run through, because all kinds of weird stuff and really nice rare items turn up. So this one, this one was a total surprise for me. Um, I did get it at an extremely severe discount because unfortunately it does have a, a warp on the outer edge that affects the first track of each side. But the jacket's in really good condition, and this particular pressing is very, very rare. So I figured I might try some of the various warp fixes that people have now. Um, but for the price point, I, I couldn't just leave it there because it was literally the, the, the seller gave me a very, very good deal on this. So this is the 1978 UK white vinyl reissue of the Beatles' final album, Let It Be. This isn't as well known as the really famous white vinyl 1978 pressing of the White Album, which is hailed among audiophiles and a lot of people as perhaps being the definitive uh, version of the stereo White Album. Um, I've heard needle drop samples and it sounds amazing, uh, but that thing usually goes for you know at least several hundred dollars, and everybody lusts after it as a uh, especially Beatles collectors. And then of course the whole notion of it being on white vinyl and being a white pressing from the 70s. Um, so this one is not as well known. Um, I'd actually forgotten they had done this on white vinyl until I was flipping through and noticed it was a laminated cover and then the little sticker the seller put on there. So again, the jacket's actually in really good shape for its age and much better than you find copies of the standard version. Because uh, especially this album, the US copies, which sound can sound pretty good but not as good as a uk original that of course costs substantially more um but usually every time i find one of these just the standard copy it's just trashed um so of course as you as i said before this is laminated and you can see the the laminates kind of started to peel because you know it's already getting on up there in years but it's in really good shape there's some slight creasing but you know for the 10 bucks i paid for this the the cover alone is is in really great shape and then what's also nice, the rear is also laminated, as it wasn't always the fact that they would laminate both sides. Um, so for 10 bucks alone, the cover's in great shape. So I thought it was doing pretty good. But, of course, the main draw is, of course, the mastering and the vinyl itself, which I will show you here. And indeed, it is on white vinyl. And of course, colored vinyl pressings were much less common back in the day. Um, they were much more about, um, they would be used much more often as specialty releases, things like that. So this was not advertised as a really great, you know, cutting or mastering, which it is. Um, there are debates on, you know, which version of Let It Be is the best sounding version, but uh, this is definitely in the, um, in, it's one of the top contenders. And uh, it's in really great shape aside from the warp problem. So um, the seller said he was able to get it to track both sides on everything but the first track on either side. And that the um, warp only affected one side more than another. But it is, I don't know how well this is going to come across, but the outer edge warp is, it is kind of severe. And it's kind of one of those up and down warps um it's not not horrible not not of course not the worst i've seen but again the the rest of the surface is so clear that i just couldn't leave it sitting there so uh yeah he, he sold it to me for 10 bucks so this is definitely going to become my go-to for let it be but i will have to figure out something to do for the uh first side tracks <laughs> or um you know i don't know if i want to put this through uh the vinyl flat oven uh, device that some people use or use the trays of glass or different things, but, um, you know, it, it's it's such a great piece that I've, I felt that I should just give it a good home and, you know, at least the rest of it is enjoyable. But again, it's definitely not something you see every day, and I was just determined, at, you know, 
This is the best condition copy I've seen, particularly at $10, and particularly the uh, 78 UK white vinyl pressing. So if you come across one of these, definitely grab it if it's at a nice price. But usually, if it hadn't been for the warp, these usually go for, you know, more like $75 to $100 at least. So it's not, not quite as crazy as the white vinyl... Um, white album pressing but uh you know it's it's getting up there and it's definitely definitely not common this next one is is an album i've been trying to find a good copy for a long time and it's surprisingly difficult for this band of course they're more well known and uh with the vinyl resurgence any well-known band uh, particularly 60s, 70s, 80s era, uh, is getting much more expensive, much more difficult to find clean, good, well-priced copies. So um, I always hold off on Eagles albums unless it's you know got the original texture cover, it's an early or original pressing, uh, early stampers and everything. So this was a really nice original texture cover copy of their On the Border album with the correct original stampers, with the correct dead wax uh, write-off, because most of their albums usually have a little sentence hidden there, and it's hidden on the dead wax somewhere. Um, and like I said, the cover is textured, so of course it's picked up some dirt over the years. But uh, compared to most copies of this particular album you find, it's in really nice shape, and it was actually on sale, so it was under 5 bucks, which is really not common for Eagles albums in this day and age, what with the final resurgence and all. So again, just something I've been meaning to pick up. I've been trying to get their um, main albums and get clean original pressings that aren't, you know, marked sky high. So this was a nice find. And let me see. I can't remember. I'll look at the Dead Wax really quick. Of course, it's on the Asylum label. But the Dead Wax marking on this particular one, so if you're looking for original copies. Um, so it's He Who Hesitates is Lunch. And then, yeah, it's just on side one. It's, there's not one on side two. Uh, the other great thing is that this is a really nice mastering by Lee Holko out when he was at uh, Sterling. So one of the really great engineers uh, cut this record. And, of course, you'll want to find a copy like this that's early and has his scrawl on the dead wax. Um, so, yeah, this was a nice find. Well, this next one was just in really pristine shape and surprisingly not very expensive, but that may be also because prog rock is not usually as super collectible as other things, and um, unfortunately there's not a whole lot of diehard Genesis fans out there in the modern generation, but uh, you know at least it makes it cheaper for me. So I've been really trying to get into earlier Genesis albums, so this is a really super minty copy of the classic Foxtrot album. This is an original UK pressing on the Charisma label with the Mad Hatter labels on it. Um, and it's this beautiful gatefold. Again, it's in super minty shape, so I couldn't just leave it sitting there. Um, and it was not very expensive. Like I've been able to find most of the early albums so far on good UK pressings for between $10 and $15, which was what I got this one for. And again, it's got this absolutely fantastic gatefold. And you have the lyrics inside with the band member photos. A pretty nice layout, actually. And again, the, the quality of the card stock's really good. And I'm super surprised it's held up this well um, over all this time. Of course, it is a little bit, you know, uh, flimsier since it is a UK pressing and their card stock is usually a lot thinner. Um, so it's much easier to get, um, you know, creases and cover damage because it's a lot thinner than the bulkier, uh, thicker U.S. sleeves. But on the flip side, you know, U.S. sleeves are prone to ring wear and getting, um, you know, all kinds of stinkiness over the years. So there's, there's always a trade-off. But again, it's in really immaculate shape. And then the actual LP. So, of course, it's in the original UK style sleeve. So here is the Mad Hatter Charisma sleeve that you're going to want to look for for all your early Genesis albums. And there are some really great U.S. pressings out there. I've heard some really good ones, um, and there's tons of debate back and forth, but the general consensus is if you want the best-sounding early Genesis uh, albums, general rule of thumb is go for U.K. Charisma pressings. And it's surpri I'm really surprised how cheap they are. Uh, just, you know, keep looking around, and, you know, I, I never thought in a million years I'd find... UK Genesis pressings in, you know, 
Middle Tennessee or, you know, just in regular record shops. So they are out there. But, uh, you know, with, with anything Prague, I think it's also very important to, you know, search for clean playing copies because you have the long instrumental passages. And the last thing you want to do is be listening to miles and miles of surface noise. I thought the white vinyl uh, Let It Be was going to be the big surprise in terms of LPs for me, um, you know, in the in the recent past and at the record convention. But then I came across this for a absurdly dirt cheap price, and I was like, I've it's been topped. Wow. Um, so this this was really shocking to find. I found it in one of the local shops, right out in the regular new arrivals, not on the rare wall, not on the import wall, nothing like that. Plus, they had a store sale going on, so I got this for an absurdly cheap price. Um, and surprisingly, the jacket's in really good shape. So this is a original 1974 uh, island UK pressing of Roxy Music's Country Life with the iconic uh, mostly nude model sleeves in front of the, uh, in front of the shrubbery. Um, so yeah, this was, I'm, I'm just astonished. Uh, this is actually the first UK, uh, Roxy album I've been able to find. Um, it's always been my goal for, for Roxy and several other bands to just go for original UK pressings. Um, and I've been trying to do that with The Clash. I'm only two away from having the main run in UK pressings. Uh, but Roxy in particular, you don't come across the even the US original pressings of the first few albums. Uh, it's only primarily the stuff from the 1980s or Avalon or um, the Greatest Hits or the Brian Ferry solo albums. Um, so it's really uncommon these days to find Roxy albums floating around in the bins and particularly original UK island pressings on the Pink Rim labels. And, you know, I would have thought this particular album, the cover probably would have been trash because it would have been probably looked at a lot or framed or you know, perhaps hidden away on a shelf, keep away from prying eyes. Um, but yeah, it's in really remarkable shape for for the price I found it for. There's a little wear, unfortunately, on the side edge and on some of the corners, but it's not bad at all. There's no creasing. Um, there is a slight gloss to the jacket that's still on there and hasn't started peeling or anything, so that's really, really nice. Um, like I said, I've never even got to handle one of these. I've never found one before. And then the rear is just more of the plant life. Um, so yeah, this this was a complete surprise. These will usually go well above uh, $50 or so, especially in really good shape. So to find this for way under 20 plus it's on sale, uh, that was just like, <laughs> like one of those things that makes you inspired to go record hunting again because... It's usually dead and dried up, and there's not a lot of good finds out there anymore, or everything's too overpriced. So this is one of those finds, along with the uh, Let It Be copy, uh, that really inspires you to get back into the thrill of the record hunt. And then to show you the label, if you're unaware what uh, Pink Rim Island means, uh, that refers to the literal um, pink rim around the island label. This is how you identify, uh, you know, first pressings of, of Roxy albums from this era or any island release of this era. So if you see something and it refers to original Pink Rim Island or UK Pink Rim Island, it's referring to this label that has the pink rim around it. So, yeah, this 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 is really astonishing. Um, you know, it's, it's got a, a little bit of scuffing, but, you know, for, for the age, you know, this is a UK original from 1974. Um, it's in really remarkable shape, and especially at the price I found this for, I was just astonished. So yeah, this this became the the find of of, of uh, definitely the month. Uh, if not, uh, you know, hopefully there's some other cool finds of the year, but this is definitely you know right up there. So this next one was a total blind buy. Uh, at the convention, there were a lot of tables that had uh, you know cheap boxes out, three for ten or four for ten or two for five, things like that. Uh, so I picked up a, a few odds and ends or collection gaps or, or things like that because usually uh, at the convention, even the cheap records are in really, really nice shape and it's a lot of dealers looking to just move extra copies of more common stuff. So this one was a blind buy because it's an still in the shrink wrap. I think it's a later 80s reissue, but um, it's got a great uh, cutting, so I figured why not because it was literally like 
a buck fifty. <laughs> so this is the uh, this is a reissue, reissue pressing of the Yesterday's album by Yes. Still in the shrink wrap, still has the hype sticker, but it has the Super Saver Series sticker, which seems to indicate that it may be a reissue pressing from sometime later on in the 80s. Um, but again, I'm not entirely sure because it's not like this stuff is completely marked all the time. So I'll have to search it up on Discogs and check it out. I'm pretty sure it's a later reissue pressing. But it's in really immaculate shape, and uh, particularly Yes albums seem to be. The original pressings are really beat up in the bins, um, and so it's hard to get good jackets. You can actually look at and appreciate the artwork, because by now original uh, jackets are just worn down with age, beaten, the spines are shot, especially on the big fold-out ones. So you get the very simple but nice-looking inner here, and then the custom label is still on here. Uh, but the reason why I went ahead and picked this up, it's super clean, and it's actually mastered by George Piros when he was still at Atlantic. So if you know anything about um, you know particular in mastering engineers and uh, their cutting signatures, you know that uh, there are certain names or initials that if you see it on a nice clean slab of wax, even if it's a later reissue, um, chances are it's going to sound really, really good. And uh, George Piros has cut some he cut some really great uh, reissues, some of which are even better than original copies. For example, um, his cutting of uh, Led Zeppelin One, his reissue cutting from about uh, 1975 or so, I think is darn near definitive. Um, of course, I've never heard an original UK Plum copy, but uh, I did manage to track down his version of Zeppelin One, which I think is amazing. Um, almost, you know, it's like right up there, even with the RL Zeppelin II Holy Grail. Um, so George Pierce is one of those people, if I see his initials on something and it's nice and cheap, I just, I just buy it. I'm, I'm not a super huge, uh, prog fan or yes fan, but I, I figured this, this is certainly worth a buck 50. It's, it's super clean. All right, this last LP is a total upgrade copy for me. I've had several copies of this. I'm obsessed with this album. Uh, it's one of my all-time favorite soundtracks, and it gets a lot of flack thrown at it for being, you know, ostensibly too 1980s, but it serves the film perfectly, and I think it's the band's best album. And that, of course, is Wang Chung's immortal soundtrack for To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, this is a pristinely mint copy, and it's an original promo release, hence the promo stamper here. So um, I have a really good copy that I've had for years, but... You know, it's it was, you know, a promo mint copy for, you know, a dollar. So, <laughs> of course, I was going to get it. Cover's in really good shape. Um, so I, I figured I'd see if there's any difference. I'm pretty sure it's exactly the same uh, matrix stamp information as my standard copy. But, uh, you know, anytime I see a promo copy of something for cheap, I don't pass it up because I love promos. I can't help it. If I see that little gold stamp somewhere, I get really excited. Um, so it's... Pretty much the standard pressing. Like I said, it's the same jacket, same everything on the Geffen label. And the sound quality on this is really, really good. If you've never heard the actual soundtrack cuts, instead of just, um, and you've only ever seen it, uh, heard it in the film mix, um, it definitely opens up a lot more because, of course, the film is from 1985, released in Dolby Stereo. So there is a lot of limitation placed on the music because it has to be put into a mix for a 1980s film um, and a lower budgeted one, too, at that. So if you've actually put this on, if you've never heard the actual soundtrack version before, um, it's, it's a real eye-opener. It's really nice and dynamic, sounds really, really great, uh, and may convert you to being a fan of the score if you weren't already before, because it's amazing. Um, and this also made me um, enjoy the music so much so that I started looking at other Wang Chung albums, their earlier albums, and then I picked up some of the singles of uh, To Live and Die in L.A., so... Uh, this was a no-brainer and just a really awesome upgrade copy. This next one was literally dirt cheap. Um, they have CDs and some cassettes at the conventions and most record stores now. Of course, cassettes are making a big comeback. There are even new cassettes made, which the fascination for I really don't get because I grew up with cassettes and the limitations and the frustrations of cassettes. Um, but since I've seen them start to come back, there there's a handful that I always said that, you know, if I found them for like a buck or so, I would I would pick them up just out of nostalgia's sake. Um, but really the only one that I'm interested in is I would love to pick up um, all the REM albums on cassette. I still have 
um, the one I grew up with. I had the cassette of Chronic Town growing up. That was my my copy. Um, but uh, I'd, I'd pretty much started buying their albums on CD when when I started buying CDs. Um, but I figured, you know, my favorite band. I have all their other releases. I have all the LPs. I have most of the reissues. I have all the CDs, the DVDs, the uh, big box sets. Why as well have the cassettes too? Um, so I finally found my second REM cassette. So this is the cassette for Automatic for the People. Um, it's in pretty good shape. Like I said, um, it was marked at two bucks. They gave it to me for a buck. Um, so <laughs> I was like, okay, I can do that. Um, cause cassette prices are starting to shoot up because people are collecting them now. And I'm like, why exactly? Um, but anyway, it's a really nice cut down of the full album art. But what's cool about this is it has a custom yellow plastic cassette which matches the yellow plastic of the original uh, CDs. If you look at the actual CD tray inside the jewel case, it's this same yellow color. And uh, they always named their album sides, which carried over to the cassettes, but then, of course, not to the CDs, because CDs don't have sides. So here you have the drive side and the ride side. And uh, I just thought it was just such a nice little piece and super cheap and nice shape, and it had this actual yellow cassette. So I was like, okay. And then you have the fold down of the really awesome, to me, iconic uh, Anton Corbin photos of the band that were in the original sleeve. And then it folds out really, really nicely. So this is definitely one of the better cassette packages I've seen in a long while. And uh, this is one of those albums I, I, of course, grew up on, but, you know, my mom had bought the CD pretty much day of release. So this is one of those that I never heard on cassette. So I figured, you know, it's it's nostalgia, but why not? It's it's literally dirt cheap. And I'm sure the next time I see one of these, it'll be like, you know, at least five or ten dollars or something crazy like that, because people are buying cassettes again. Who would have thought it? Last but not least. Uh, apparently, I find Laserdiscs anywhere I go. It just happens. Uh, if somebody has a random little box of Laserdiscs somewhere, I seem to stumble across it. And usually it's the same generic stuff that, you know, you see everywhere. And, you know, hopefully it's not a copy of Speed marked for $25. Um, but anyway, uh, I was leaving the convention and happened to notice on my way out a, a little box on a side table uh, that had Laserdiscs. One dollar each, or you know, five for ten, or whatever. So I'm like, okay, well. And then I saw a little, a little bit of red sticking out on the top, and I'm like, no, no, it can't be. No, I'm, I'm seeing things. Um, so I had to buy a, a bunch of commons just to get uh, one or two I really wanted. But this one in particular, because I couldn't believe it was there, and I was like, oh my gosh. So I don't care how many commons I have to buy; it's still worth it. Um, so I got a big stack for like ten dollars. Um, which is still pretty cheap considering I didn't have to pay for shipping or something. Um, but yeah, it, it was all for this. So this was at the record convention. This is the DTS pressing of Jurassic Park, one of the top tier DTS titles that everybody wants. Um, it's known for having a really aggressive soundtrack presentation. It was one of the first big top tier DTS titles released in the 97, 98 late era of LDs when they started making DTS discs. And of course, DTS still carries a, uh, you know, a decent amount of price value. So uh, these discs go for really crazy money still on the used market in eBay. Uh, this one in particular gets on up there. So I was shocked to see it for a dollar. And since I bought so many, I technically paid less than a dollar for this. So I was like, wow, I don't care if I have to buy another 10 commons to get this for, you know, this much. Um, unfortunately, it's got a little bit of wear here. The corner's kind of torn, but the rest of the jacket's in great shape. And it's it got this really nice glossy sleeve. Uh, it's the same. It's the standard. Um, well, it's got the standard universal starry background letterbox and everything. Um, of course, you could tell it apart from the AC3, AC3 pressing because of the DTS moniker. And the rear is identical except for the DTS marker there. Um, of course, no special features. It's the movie only. And then you get this big box telling you, if you don't have a decoder or receiver that handles DTS, why are you looking at this disc? Because you're screwed. But uh, yeah, it does have the same gatefold opening 
with the super annoying <laughs> discs that come out of the middle, but it's actually in really good shape because uh, it's very common for uh, this particular style to have damage along the spine. So again, I'm just astonished that this was there and this cheap. So I was like, holy crap. So um, I am looking forward to firing this up and comparing it to the box and AC3 versions as well. Um, Cause I know everybody has their own particular uh, version that they like. So this was a complete and utter surprise. Just goes to show you that you can find laser discs anywhere where you least expect it. So don't be afraid to look in every little cubby hole or hidey hole or shoe box underneath a bunch of shelves on the floor of some random record store and they think they're records because they're mixed in and all that stuff so yeah this this was really astonishing and in a lot of ways this was even more surprising than some of the lps i picked up because i'd never seen a laser disc at a record convention um so yeah and they were very pleased for me to buy as many as i did they were like can you just take the whole box and i'm like well i don't need all these but can can i have these <laughs> So yes, really, really astonishing. And um, I go over the other ones I picked up in my uh, in my latest LD video. So I talk about this and, and those as well. So if you're curious to see what else I picked up, it'll be in that. Well, that does it for this batch of highlights of records and tapes and random oddities I've found uh, in uh, record stores in the past month or two and uh, it's been some really amazing highlights i'm very glad i got to stop by the convention this time uh i was debating on on going or not and then uh, there was a talk on the last uh culture dog live stream about uh, record shows and such so that kind of kind of swung me to to making the effort to to stop by so i'm very very glad i did uh, some really, really uncommon uh, things to find out in the wild in, in shops this time around. So so I wanted to make a, a whole video about it just to uh, just go over some of the crazy stuff that actually does turn up in, in local shops and conventions. So never be afraid to dig through that last last bin or milk crate or cardboard box wherever you may be, whether it's a flea market or garage sale or even a tiny record shop somewhere. There, you, you never know what's going to turn up. So uh, hopefully you found some interesting things and, uh, you know, stuff to add to your Discogs, a never-ending want list. So uh, thanks for watching, everybody.